Aja isi eji kwa eze A kwa otsa ni jele Ihu wa ya wihu a kwa eli Ebu obe isi eji eze A kwa otsa ni jele Arere eje akana ya eleba anu Ebu obe isi eji eze A kwa otsa ni jele Obo aka na re a kwa eze aka wanya A kwa otsa ni jele Nko a kwa pa ne duo a ma pa pi He is a renowned medical doctor, a NASA space scientist, and now the world is about to see the other side of this versatile, very versatile gentleman. As a historian of no mean repute, academician Prince Dr. Philip Njemanzi is the author of a book, Igbo Mediators of Yahweh Culture of Life. This actually is a book series that has upturned human history as we knew it. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. First, it's only appropriate that the viewers out there get to meet you formally. May we meet you, sir. Thank you. Um, as you rightly said, my names are academician Prince Dr. Philip Njemanze. I'm a medical doctor. I did my first degree in uh, Rostov State Medical Institute in Russia, um, now the Russian Federation, and then moved to do my postgraduate in uh, Klinikum Gross Harden in Munich, uh, University of Munich, then went on to do my uh, postgraduate fellowship in London University uh, in the Department of Angiology, and then further fellowship at Bowman Gray School of Medicine in North Carolina, Winston-Salem. So uh, after that, then I moved on to become an assistant research professor at uh, St. Louis University Medical Center uh, researching on stroke. Uh, I do a lot of uh, work in neurosciences and uh, neurocardiology with a lot of interest, looking at the connection between the brain and the heart. Uh, this is in a nutshell my CV. I am married, uh, happily married with my uh, three children, um, Philip, uh, Nkem, and Odera. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Well, I just noticed that you used the title academician. Please, <laughs> explain to the viewers, what does this mean? Well, yes, I'm an academician of the International Academy of Astronautics. Um, the, the whole space agencies around the world, uh, NASA, uh, the Japanese Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, all the leading neuroscientists, um, actually all the leading space scientists, both medical and non-medical, are in an academy that is under the UNESCO. And this academy, uh, the, all the eminent scientists, and the highest level of uh, academic uh, nomination is at this level of being called an academician. That means there are things in the area of space sciences, which you are the foundational scientist that actually uh, put it in place, or that has made a, made a fundamental difference in our knowledge of uh, space sciences. So I'm just one of the leading academics, uh, academicians in the world on, on space sciences. Yes. Very enlightening. You also have uh, the prince title attached to your name. Are you a prince? Yes, I am a prince. Um, I am from the Njemanzi royal family. Uh, this is a dynasty. The Njemanzi 
dynasty has been a dynasty that has been there uh, from over 1000 BC. And I will explain this in more detail as we go around, I go around the whole story. Uh, but just simply said, the name uh, means na eje amana eze. What that means uh, in English is that they go to become kings of the indigenous people. And what this is the royal dynasty as we go through the story of the line of the person you call or know as David. And in, in Igbo we say Diwedo, a man who is fair in complexion. And uh, that dynasty spans uh, up to the present day. And I will explain some of these intricacies as we go along the story. That's good. I, I know you are a medical doctor and also a NASA space scientist. That's much we know. I had worked with you at least when you hosted the International Conference on Mission to Mass, the African Perspective. What do you research on? Yes, uh, as a researcher, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, uh, that's the major interest I have, looking at how the brain works, basically, and the control systems in the brain. How does the brain control the heart? And how does the brain work within its, uh, the two hemispheres? I put a lot of emphasis on looking at the relationship between the right and the left brain. For example, one of my fundamental works was to look at uh, the control of intelligence in the brain. I say, uh, looked at wh which center, is it in the left brain or in the right brain that controls human intelligence in men and women. Uh, one of the fundamental things we found out was that in men, the intelligence is in the right brain, while in females, the intelligence is in the left brain. So we now looked at uh, things like facial processing, color processing, and we see the same pattern. And these investigations and these results uh, are groundbreaking for neuroscience. Uh, in 2005, it actually redefined the entire concept of brain function. And this has been confirmed by all of my colleagues around the world, including American and all the scientists from other countries. And so this, this is the type of thing I look at. And I also have a lot of interest in looking at brain-heart connections and what we call the field we call neurocardiology and uh, I've done fundamental works to look at what happens to consciousness when do people become unconscious and what are the things that lead to unconsciousness and then this type of research and replicated that type of research is simulated space environment and then in high performance aircraft you know the pilots that pass out uh, I was able to do that uh, at the Pentagon facility in uh, Niagara Falls to look at what happens to F-18 pilots when they pass out. Uh, that type of research are the things I, I normally uh, engage myself with. Well, let's get back to us because we've been in space all this while. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let us get into the title of the book, Ibo Mediators of Yahweh Culture of Life. Why did you choose such a title? Well, um, this book series, uh, I, I hope to make it an encyclopedic series, uh, is to tell the story of the people you call Igbo. I know our viewers might not be uh, familiar with what the word Igbo means. Igbo is to mediate. And the group of people who God, in his infinite knowledge, made priests to mediate between him and humanity. And these people, they, are, they were called the chosen people. The chosen people are chosen because of priesthood. And these people are the people you call Igbo today. Before they were called Igbo, that's the, before the consecration of these people as a whole tribe of priests, they were called Izaraeli. Izaraeli in English means you answered the Most High. And that's what you know in English as Israel. But in Igbo, it's Izara 
Eli, you answer the Most High. So by telling their story, the Igbo mediators of Yahweh culture of life, you say it's Yahweh, but the correct thing in Igbo is Yah in Hawaii. Yah in Hawaii. Yah means God. Inho, the divine light. Wo in here to be. That is this wo to be. Then in him here means enlightenment. So if we look at that, that will be God, who is the divine light that enlightens. Uh, so the the whole uh, title summarizes the story of the people we call Ibo, the mediators. Hmm. In the book contents, you did say things like uh, Ibo people were pharaohs of ancient Egypt, kings of ancient Israel. Ibos built the pyramids and invented electricity, computer, automobile, airplane, and submarines. All these facts, are they founded in the book? If that is the case, what really happened to the Ibus before we got into the details, before we now go into the details of this book? Yes, very interestingly, the, the things you enumerated, yes, the whole, uh, in the book series, uh, as we go along the, the several volumes of the book, you will see that the 360 uh, uh, pharaohs, um, we call them in, in Ibu, Eferoha, your worship of the people. Uh, we are all Igbos. They, they were the people who built the pyramids. They were the people who invented writing. They were the people who invented uh, the, the battery circuits. I show it in the book. I actually show uh, typical uh, battery circuits which were invented then. I actually show the aeroplane um, with perfect tetrahedral structure which uh, has been tested uh, by uh, companies like uh, Lockheed Martin the models, they have been put in a wind tunnel and they fly. Uh, so that means even today's technology, even with the uh, today's uh, technology, the, the engineers have not even achieved this level of perfection uh, as we speak. So um, the Igbos really, we are the kings of ancient Israel. They were the, the, the pharaohs. They were the... Uh, People we know as Carthaginians, uh, and then some of them are known as Phoenicians. Uh, so uh, we, we are actually rewriting the fundamentals of the history. And there was a major stumbling block for the world not to have known all these facts the way we know it today. And the fact is because they cannot read the hieroglyphics, which by the grace of God I can read. Of what significance? Going by what all you've just said now, of what significance is the timing of the release of this book? Well, I must say here that uh, it's providential in a way because uh, it, they, we, all what we are witnessing today, uh, all what is going around the world tells of about an end time event. That is already clear. We, you, all what you need to know about is to look at the news and look at the Bible and look at all what has been said all through the ages. So what we are witnessing are end time events. And these end time events, I'm going to explain more what these end time events are, you call it the apocalypse. Uh, but when we explain this in Igbo, apia kola apa ose, iyi apa ose, apia kola iyi apa ose. So what that means in Igbo is that we have brought to an end the evil of unbelief in the Almighty God. So this is a period when there will be no doubt in anybody's mind that there is God. And through that knowledge and awakening, we will now come to accept the tenets of God and live by it and end the evil that is on earth today. So this, this is the time. So this book is a guide so that we can travel 400,000 years back to read the very beginning of writing, the very beginning of what was archived. In fact, Igbo's 
Igbos wrote everything down in rock paintings, in, in writings that you see even around you, but you can't read it. So they wrote everything down. And what this book does is to give you a key so you can also know how to read the hieroglyphics, know how to be able to explain what you are seeing and be able to get this documentation uh, very, very correctly. So what we are trying to do at this time is to arm everybody with the knowledge and power to read and understand. And once you understand, that power will now transform your life and the life of where you live. Well, if this book is about belief in God and the Holy Trinity, what then is the Holy Trinity? Yes, um, it's very interesting, you know, and I'm going to explain as we go along. Most all the English words, you know, were formed from Igbo. They were formed from Igbo consonants. So if you take the word Trinity, Ato Rino Tuya. Ato Rino Tuya. Ato means three. In. Within. Re. No to. In one, God is Yah. So, what it means is that there are three persons in one God. Yes, it's not too different from the, our understanding today. But what actually it explains in Igbo is that if you take the three aspects of God, now, God the Father, we say, we say in Igbo, Oziri. It was mistransliterated as Osiris. Oziri means the one that sends. Now, his son, God the Son, is Orisa. Orie Esa. The Almighty God's word. Then, the Holy Spirit, the word spirit forms, is, was formed from Asi Aparu Ato, the one who tells you and takes to you the instructions of God. So you can see that these three are functional definitions of the same one God. He is one, but his function to take that instruction to you, you need the Spirit. Ase Aparato. We also say in Igbo, Ama. Now, to the God's word, the word, the world, the, 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 the word itself, as you call Jesus Christ, is comes from the word Iwu Orie Edu. Iwu Orie Edu. Iwu the instrument, the laws. Orie God Almighty that leads. The Lord, the the laws of God Almighty that leads. So you see the three functional definitions are all describing the functional states of one God. We're going deeper and deeper. Yes. And I can't wait to get to the deepest. I want to take you back to the high technologies of electricity, computer, automobile, airplane and submarines you mentioned on the cover page of this book. Where are these Igbo technologies from the Egyptian times? Yes, from the Egyptian times. This is a well-known fact, even to the Western governments and establishment. Um, they are very much aware and it's chronicled in history. Um, Napoleon did go on expedition about 1789 and the main task of that expedition was to look for the advanced technologies that we are in Egypt. So they went on the expedition and he went with over 5,000 engineers and scientists. In fact, almost every prominent engineer or mathematician in France 
was in that mission. People like Fourier, you know, Fourier analysis, he was there. Uh, Etienne, so he was there. Uh, Volta, he was there. So almost all the elite scientists and technologists were all accompanying Napoleon on this mission. And the mission was to find the technologies that were developed by Ibus in, in Egypt. And they did find them. They did find so many items. Uh, so the, these technologies were looted from Egypt. They were, as I said, electricity, batteries. Uh, you could see within 50 years after this, after this uh, exploration by the uh, French, almost everything you know of was invented. They use the word in, in Western literature calling it the Renaissance. The Renaissance was nothing but actually the decoding of Igbo technology that was found in Egypt. That was what the, uh, the Renaissance meant. And how did this happen? They found a piece of stone. That piece of stone is called Palermo stones. That piece of stone had an inscription in hieroglyphics and Greek letters. They, you know, ancient Greek, I will, I will explain, they were also Igbos. So these Igbos in ancient Greek wrote in scripts that you can actually relate to the letters you have in, um, in modern day Greek, Hellenic Greek. So it was possible to decode some of the writings of, uh, of Igbos. So what had happened uh, subsequently was over these 50 years they were able to decode many of the technologies that led to the invention of what you know as uh, uh, different machines in, uh, with, that we are using today. If you actually take the patent publication by Volta about uh, um, that was about uh, 19... 1900, you will see that it's an exact replica of what he found in Egypt. And in my book, I put the two pictures for you to compare. So, and it's so with all the technologies. What had happened to the French was that even when they got these items and they were coming out, they were actually ambushed by the British who waited for them. Uh, because the British had a superior navy, naval force. So they were able to capture a lot of the technologies the French had taken. So when you look at history, you will see that some of these inventions that were captured by the British, the British published them and uh, claimed their originality. Some of the inventions were, were gotten by the French and uh, the French published them. So. This was what actually happened. Uh, it was not a matter of uh, things we are just all of a sudden in 50 years, everybody was in darkness and everybody now saw light and started inventing materials. All what happened was that they found these Igbo technologies and decoded how to use them. And even up to today, if you look at some of the complex technologies we have, the cell phone and all these things also came from Igbo technology. Uh, I will explain as we go along uh, the, the Roxwell uh, accident uh, by the UFOs. And I will talk about that. Uh, you can see also on the cover, I, I make the emphasis that even the UFOs, that is the unidentified flying objects, are Igbos who are not living in our own galaxy. They are not living in our, in our own galaxy. They are living, they are extraterrestrials. They come in and they speak. But how did we know that? Because the beams that we are crashed on Earth during one of those incidents in Roswell was if we were able to uh, see the writing and decode it as Igbo language. And we will show that in the, in the book uh, how this happened. Now, let us get into the crux of the matter. Where is Jerusalem? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. The word Jerusalem comes from the Igbo word Yerusalem. 
Now, I must explain this very clearly. The three letters that constituted a problem for mis, uh, for uh, transliteration for the uh, Mesorite Jews and those after them was Jiri, E, and Ya. These are letters that are used often in Igbo, especially the Oweri dialect. So, I'm Jirigi, I sent you. E can mean evil, it can mean water. And uh, the word Jerusalem comes from that E, Jerusalem. Evil should not touch me. So this evil should not touch me uh, was the name of the city. And that evil there meant abortion and contraception. Because one thing that was very distinctive about Jerusalem, which is the, uh, which is the present day Oweri city, was that you could not perform any sort of abortion or contraception there. If you did it, you were stoned to death, both the man and the woman. So this was a major distinctive place on earth there when the, where there was no abortion or contraception tolerated. And you paid for your life should you ever engage in anything like that. So that was the name of the city. Now this city is what you know today as Oweri city. Now, how did it become Oweri from Jerusalem? From Jerusalem? It became Oweri during the reign of the person you know as David in Igbo is Diwedo, a man who is fair in complexion. Now, when he was the king of Oweri, after the time of the man you call Saul, Saul actually the correct thing because they saw SL and they said they vowelized it as Saul. The correct thing is Isiala, the head of the land. Uh, he was a man from the present day Onicha, Utua Niocha, and of the tribe of, uh, you say in the Bible, Benjamin, Be Njo Imem. Now, after his rule, he, he had the title called Owe. Ele. Today is is kind of mispronounced and called Owele, but his real title was Owe Ele. Now, after his reign, the reign the reign was moved to Owere. You know, you know the story in the Bible about Samuel and his uh, coronation uh, of David as king. When it was moved, the title. David took was Owe Eri, leaders from time immemorial. The title of Saul was Owe Ele, that means leaders you look up to. So he took up the title Owe Eri, that is Eri in Igbo means from time immemorial. So when he became king of Oweri, he, the name of Oweri, the city of David, Owe Eri. Now, I will explain more that his compound was Ama Owem, which is all uh, mispronounced today as Amawom, but it's Ama Owem. That's the center heart town uh, uh, of the heart of the town Oweri. So, this city you are in right now is actually the holy city of Jerusalem. That can be confirmed archaeologically that is also by ethnolinguistics that led us to this clue and we know that archaeologically this is correct we are is nazareth and egypt we are jesus mary and joseph ran to if you knew all this about the present day worry so we are is nazareth and egypt we are jesus mary and joseph ran to yes that's very interesting because you know um it, it, it's, it's a very good thing for for some of our viewers to look at the geography maps and uh, try to understand the relationship within 
with, the, uh, with, with you know between the cities mentioned in the Bible. If you go to Israel today, or if you look at your map, you will see that the city called Nazareth is 300 miles away from Egypt. 300 miles. Does that look like a place Mary, who is heavily pregnant, uh, Joseph, and you know, uh, at that time, will run to? So, of course not. Uh, it, it's absurd for anybody to think about that. Uh, actually, it, what makes sense is that Jerusalem is just next to Nazareth. Even if you if you look at it today, it's almost forty miles away from uh, from uh, Nazareth. So it doesn't really make sense that the present day geography of the state of Israel is correct. Uh, that's not correct. What is correct is that the city called Jerusalem, which is Oweri, is just next to a place you call today Nazi. Nazareth. That word Nazareth came from Naezere Ota. Naezere Ota came from the time when Herod, the man you call Herod, uh, actually in Igbo, he said Ahorod DC. The chosen one at the top. He was the Roman prelate here in Oweri. So what he did was when he heard about the birth of our Lord Jesus, he ordered his people to go to that village that was purported to be the village of Jesus, which is just outside Oweri here. It's uh, only about uh, four kilometers away. Um, to go there and slaughter all the children two years and under. Now, the mention of two years is very important because when the Romans were here, in a way, they enforced a one-child policy. And every two years, they had a census. And that census was to count father, mother, and child. If any family we are more numbered more than three, father, mother, and child. Then the extra child was slaughtered at the gates of Jerusalem. And there were, there were about, approximately about 300 gates uh, here in Oweri. Um, surprisingly, the only time since after the Romans were here, gates were built in Oweri was the one built by uh, the present governor uh, uh, in, in Imo State. Uh, Oweli Richard Sokorocha, when he built the 300 gates. They were about the same locations that they were during the time of the Romans here. And at these gates, the children who were extra from the family that numbered maybe a family had two, that child would be slaughtered at the gate. That is why you see the section of the Bible, they said the weep, Raquel was shouting in the voice shouting in Rama and saying that her children were no more. Now, what is that about? Ariochi Elu, they were pleading to God Almighty. Oramaho, it is painful to me. So when the Miserite Jews saw the consonants, they just vowelized them, Rama and Raquel. But actually, it was the women who were pleading to Almighty God that this was very, very painful. So because of this, Jesus and Mary and Joseph had to situate themselves outside the gates of Jerusalem. That's why they were in this place you call Nazareth. Nezere Ota. Nezere Ota. So to dodge the arrows of the leaders. Nezere Ota Oha. So that's why you see the word Nazareth. And Jesus would be born in a place uh, you know today is called uh, St. Jude uh, Catholic Church. Uh, the, the premises of that St. Jude. Uh, that place is called Ebelebe wonders have happened. That's even to this day, it's called a beloved, though the locals might not know why. But because the cattle and used to 
grace there. You you would ask yourself why about December 25th in the uh, in Israel uh, where it's obviously very cold, where cattle will be grazing outside. Uh, because it didn't happen there. It happened right here. That was the reason why you have uh, that uh, uh, bath of Christ that occurred just next door uh, in Nazareth. And the place you mentioned, Egypt. Abala, they ran to a place. Yapota. So when they saw the word Abala, Yapota, they used the suffix to say, run, run away to Egypt. But what it meant was that they went to a place, Abala, which is we call it Abala today, which is next door uh, to the, the village next to, next to uh, Ora, um, in Nazareth. Nazareth. And they went to a small village there called uh, uh, Umwegweze. Umwegweze is the children where he dodged the, the, the terror. And this was exactly what happened. So much about Nazareth and Nazareth. What were the real names of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, the, the real name of Mary. Her name was Amara, the Grace. Grace, Amara. And the people would call her Amaraya. That is the Grace of God. So when it's written, you will see M R, which the, uh, well, the Mesorite Jews, who were white Hellenic Greeks. But they were moving around with Igbo priests. After the slaughter of the Igbos, they were the only white people who really knew some Igbo. And they were the people who were now translating the Bible. So when, and the Igbos only wrote in consonants. So they never, if you have to know the language to pronounce any word. Uh, so they found the consonants. They now found MR, which they vowelized as Maria. But the correct thing was Amara. Grace. Amaraya is the grace of God. So that's why you also see in other texts M R Y, which which it was vowelized as Mary. But that's her real name. Now Joseph is a little more complicated because the the people called him Onye Oje Eso Afu. The person he, he, that accompanies him to go out. So he follows, they were referring to Jesus, following Joseph to go out. Because Joseph was a sculptor. He was not a carpenter. He was a sculptor. Uh, so was Jesus a sculptor. So they carved things. And which we'll talk about, you see, uh, it's an Igbo sculptural writing. So the, the locals called him Onyo Jesu Afo. Jesu Afo. He will give you the consonants J S F, and that's how they vowelize that to get the name Joseph. Uh, but that that's the that's the that's the genesis of his name. Then Jesus himself was called by Uweri people Manu Elu, Manu Elu, a person from above. So. That was how they vowelized that to get Emmanuel. But uh, the thing was somebody from above, Manuelu, because the Igbos said Mado, but Oweri people said Mano. So that's Manuelu. Then he was also called Yahoshua. That's where you get the word Yahoshua, but it's Yahoshua. God's chosen one from the world. Now, the Onichi dialect, which is another predominant dialect in, in Igbo land, called him Ya Si Osa, God from the masses. And that was vowelized YSS. So that became Jesus, and from there, Jesus. So this is how the names came about. If the Romans were here, the Greeks were also here. <laughs> what did the Greeks and the Romans do here? Yeah, that's a very interesting story. You, you, that, that actually, um, in this area, 
of Owerri, which is called Ikenebu, uh, was actually a major place where the Roman garrison was located. Um, what happened, and we will go through this as we go through the series of the book, was that the Igbos were forced everywhere. They, were, they ruled everywhere, everywhere in the world, and we will go through that. And they, they were the Greeks. They, they called them the Attic Greeks, the Black Greeks. They were the Greeks. Ogo Rike. Ogo Rike. So, they, that's the district of strong people. And they lived in the Arctic. But, and developed a very advanced civilization. But during their fall, and we will talk about the, fa the, the, the facts that led to this, when they fell, they ran back to the promised land, which is in Ibo land, and we'll talk about that. And the people who conquered them, led by Antiochus, pursued them down to Oweri. Oweri, because all the leaders, that's why you say leaders from time in more, all the leaders uh, gathered here. So they now pursued them and occupied this place. So when they were here, what they did was that they destroyed most of the synagogues, what you know as synagogues. Asiya, Ano, Ago, Ogo. If you talk to God, you stay and make divinations or pray. So these were destroyed and they replaced them with monuments where people should go and pray. And you will see in this area called Ikenebu, there is one which, which is located at Mbare. We call Mbare. That means for the people to survive. So they marshaled the people who lived in this area of where Ikenebu, Keanebu, those to be killed. They marshaled them. They were mainly of the tribe of uh, David, uh, Dewey. They marshaled them to the temple and told them to prostrate before the Greek emperor, the image of the Greek emperor, uh, the carving, the wife and the child. In fact, I have some pictures from the 1920s that still showed uh, the uh, Antiochus image, the wife and the child, uh, you know, painted with uh, white clay. So they told the Owari people to prostrate and worship there. The Owari people refused and they slaughtered them one by one. That was how this place got its name, Keanebu, those to be killed. And when they slaughtered them one by one, the people called this place where the, the slaughtering went on, Mbare, for the people to survive. So their heads were carried and taken, and taken to the place we call Ohio Bukorisi, which is near the river area uh, you call Otamari. We will talk about that some more. So this was what happened. Then the Romans conquered the Greeks in their wars in Europe because the Igbos of Europe, the indeed Italy, you call them the, the Italians. But the oh, Italy, you see, that means they are people of black hair who were the original inhabitants of the place you call Rome. Uriyama, the God's temple. So when they overcame the Igbos there, they also pursued the Igbos to the promised land and conquered Antiochus. And when they conquered Antiochus, uh, they now took over this place. And that was a little bit of the history of what happened. I recall as a child, having noticed this Roman gladiator's kind of hairstyle. Where actually did that come from? Yes, that's very interesting because our people did uh, see the gladiators, the Roman gladiators. That was way uh, before the British came here. And the gladiators wore this type of hair. And they made hair. And uh, there were several hairstyles, uh, even with uh, the normal African way. They braided it in such a way that it looked like the gladiators. And uh, this was because for a very long time, they still kept the memories of uh, the Roman gladiators who were like terror among the people here. Um, 
As I said, the Roman gladiators were the people who accomplished all these, uh, after the Greeks, they accomplished all these murders uh, of the people. The Greeks, I just want to mention here, uh, when they killed the people, the people were called that means they were forced to bear witness so this is what you have in the bible called the book of maccabees maccabees 1 maccabees 2 that means they were forced to bear witness to the faith uh, and that's the whole story of these families and what happened is actually in the Bible.